Well, good evening, everyone, and um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And we're very pleased uh, to welcome Diana Dark uh, for the launch of her new book, Stealing from the Saracens. Um, this book is, uh, sorry, this launch is hosted jointly uh, between the Islamic Art Circle um, and the Royal Asiatic Society. And we hope to have a few more in the pipeline. Um, Diana, as many of you know, is, is a, an Arabist who's lived in the Middle East for uh, the past 30 years. Um, and she's also the author of My House in Damascus and The Merchant of Syria. And she also uh, co-authored uh, Last Sanctuary of Aleppo. Um, and I'm also, this book has been a great success so far. Um, I'm told that it is actually sold out now, so they will, must be beginning to reprint. But before we begin, uh, I just have some little bit of Zoom housekeeping. Uh, Diane is happy to answer questions at the end, but um, if you could um, put them and post them on the chat icon, and then I'll be able to relay them at the end of her talk. So I'm going to hand over to Diana now. And again, thank you very much, Diana, for doing this, all right. Well, thank you very much, Alison. And thank you to, to Rosalind as well for co-hosting this. It's a, a, great, a great privilege for me to be able to speak to what I know is a, is a very interested and um, concerned audience uh, in, this, in this subject. So by explaining about the, the title, the, the, the book, the book cover, um, which has been a very deliberate choice. And people have struggled rather with this title um, by taking it very literally, when of course it's actually a double irony. Uh, it's it's uh, Saracens from the Arabic Sarakeen, meaning people, meaning thieves. It actually goes way back to Ptolemy's uh, geography, um, pre-Islamic as a term actually meaning sort of raiders from the desert. So um, it's, it's only much later it comes to mean Arab, Arab Muslims in medieval times. But in, in Christopher Wren's day, it was, Saracens was the accepted way of referring to Arab Muslims. And so when Christopher Wren said that he used the Saracen style in the vaulting of St. Paul's, um, you know, that, that, that was the language of, of the time, of the 17th century. So um, that's why we've gone for this title and, and it's deliberate pun and irony and don't worry if you like. Um, but I'm sure many of you know actually the concept of irony in, in Arabic is quite a difficult one to get across. I mean people people say oh it's sufria or something but of course that's sarcasm which is completely different. It's, it's a, a very a very you know tricky one to get across in Arabic. Um, so anyway I'm going to screen share now and hope that this works at least and, and take you through a series of images um, explain about um, the book coming because Christopher Wren is such an absolutely key figure in the book because of his, his theory that what we call Gothic architecture should rightly be called Saracen architecture. So the way the book is structured is to kind of start from that and say, okay, was he right or not? And so we kind of look, look through a whole series of things, starting with the pre-Islamic inheritance, moving through the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Fatimids, and, and seeing how everything came in through Spain, through different various gateways into Europe, and then ending with the revival period. Um, and then the final chapter, chapter 10, is mainly images of uh, buildings that we're all very familiar with, iconic European buildings, with all their Islamic features marked up, because pretty much every single feature that we think of as Gothic architecture in very European ethos, um, in fact, came out in the Middle East, with the exception of the flying buttresses. So um, I'm going to run you through the, um, the pictures, hopefully now, and if it fails, I will <laughs> let my hosts do that as well, and I will just stick up my hand to, um, to ask them to move on. So let's hope this works. Right, so here is the first, the first image, which I hope you can all see. It shows the endorsements on the back. And um, 
of whom, you know, I must admit I'm very proud of them. And the one I'm, I'm particularly proud of is, is this one by Rowan Williams, because he, it shows that he completely got it. He understood exactly what I'm trying to say in this book about the interaction between cultures, because this is really what it's about. It's about how everything builds on everything else. People can't just appropriate something and say, oh, this is mine, I invented this. Everything, everything builds on everything else. So uh, I was delighted with his endorsement. So this is this first picture now is of Saint Denis, the Basilica of Saint Denis in northern Paris, and this is very important because this is what art historians tend to um, quote as the first Gothic building. And the abbot Suger himself, um, a very ambitious man. Um, Here's a picture of him. He put himself in, the own, in his own stained glass windows and he, and he labeled himself just to make sure everybody knew exactly who he was. And he, he, uh, he became um, very good friends with the King of France. And as part of his ambition, he wanted to promote the monarchy and ally it with the church. And he hit upon um, a very, um, you know, interesting way of doing this. And, and basically Gothic, Gothic architecture is all about light and letting in light. And the way Abbot Suger envisaged this, the, the thing that gave him the idea was a book that he was given called The Celestial Hierarchy, written by somebody called Dennis or Dionysius as it was in, in, in those days. And this is where the story gets incredibly complicated and actually quite funny in a way because this picture here is is uh is the martyr dennis um holding his own head because he was decapitated he had his head chopped off by the romans and he then apparently picked up his own head and carried on walking and he um he is recognized as the patron saint of france and hence the saint denis um and he is linked with this whole question of the celestial hierarchies because the author of the celestial hierarchies was somebody calling himself Dennis who claimed to be uh, a disciple of the Apostle Paul and so Abbot Suger genuinely believed this to be the case at the time however subsequent scholarship discovered that Dennis was in fact a, a fraud a fake and the real author of the celestial hierarchy turned out to be a sixth century Syrian monk. So he is referred to now in theological circles as pseudo Dennis the Areopagite. And so you've got this incredible conflation of the three Dennises. But um, the effect of it was that Saint Denis became immensely powerful because it was associated with Dennis and, and the philosophy of light and, and the patron saint of France. And so all future kings of France wanted to be buried there. And, and the influence of Saint Denis and the, and the new architectural style of tall pointed arches setting in the light became very influential from that point on was spread across Europe. So Saint Denis, as I call him in the book, um, from this point on, having explained the, the complicated background to him, takes us to Syria. Because, um, the book focuses or uh, has has a quite a lengthy chapter on the pre-Islamic inheritance. And this is very, very important because, of course, um, what we, um, Syria, I'm talking ancient Syria here, not, not, the, not the amputated rump that is modern Syria. Um, so ancient Syria that, of course, included Jerusalem and what we call the Holy Land today, um, basically most of the East Mediterranean. And, and in the area which is called uh, the Dead Cities, recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, finally in, in 2011, just after the war began, we have the remains of over 2,000 churches in stone scattered over the hills of what is today Idlib province, where the war is still ongoing. And these churches are the proof in stone, if you like, of that transition from pagan times into early Christian times. And this, it took centuries, of course, you know, it's not like Christian architecture just popped out automatically. It took a very long time. It took, um, you know, three, four centuries before buildings that are what we would recognize as churches um, are, are built. And the first house church, so-called, was actually also in Syria, in, in Dura Europos, uh, a trading city on the Euphrates. 
And this, this one here, this is, this is the key um, site in the dead cities of St. Simeon's Basilica, which in its day was the Santiago de Compostela of, of the entire Christian world. It was the biggest shrine. People came from Britain, from all over Europe to reach it. And it was tremendously influential and it could actually hold about 10,000 worshippers, more than Notre Dame, you know, centuries later. And so it's difficult to overstate the, the importance of this building and these, this group of um, the dead cities in, in northern Syria, northwestern Syria. So an example of um, how powerful his cult was, St. Simeon, St. Simeon Stylites, because he he preached from the top of a pillar, a style in Greek. And so here, just recently in, um, uh, in July, I actually visited in France a little village called St. Simeon, named after uh, Syrian St. Simeon. Uh, and the, the church has got stained glass windows with him here. This, this, is, this is one of them. It's got relics of St. Simeon. Um, and if you start looking all over France, you see, you see more signs of this pilgrim, uh, you know, the, the fact that pilgrims brought back many, many things from, from, uh, from Syria. And one of the other key uh, uh, buildings in this group of dead cities with 2000 churches is the one called Kalblauzi, because it's the most complete of the churches showing this twin towers um, between uh, flanking a monumental entrance. And the reason for this, this is on the pilgrimage route to St. Simeon's Basilica, and the, the monumental entrance is for the pilgrims to enter, to make them feel that they've arrived somewhere important. That, that's the origin of the style, to sort of mark, right, you have reached an important way station on your way. And this is, this is what gradually then, this uh, Kalblauze was completed in 490, and and um, or 460 even I think it was and then and then um, St Simeon's Basilica was was 490. So this is before I Sophia was built in, in Constantinople. So very very influential and important to to see the styles here. So that's a sort of quick whiz through the pre-Islamic inheritance. Now um, the book moves on to the Umayyads, the first Islamic empire um, that began in 661 and ended in, in 750. And uh, I was astonished actually, as I began to research this period, just how much the Umayyads contributed to what the styles that we later took in to, um, to Europe. And obviously the Dome of the Rock here was, was Abdul Malik's first political statement to say that uh, Islam has arrived, you know, he dominates the, 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 the skyline of, of Jerusalem. And uh, within it, inside, there are two very significant things. Um, in the arches uh, at the bottom, around the circumambulatory around the stone, um, there are the first pointed arches. This is originally when it's built, um, because the, the masons um, realized that to make the two, uh, the two circumambulatories match up perfectly, <coughs> the arches had to, had to be shortened. So um, this is where almost potentially accidentally um, pointed arches appear. And up in the dome, you will see there trefoil arches, the first appearance of trefoil arches. And then obviously the Dome of the Rock, um, tremendously important and influential building. And, and here we get to another um, confusion, a, a medieval confusion, basically rather like the Dennis confusion that um, Abbot Suger uh, um, built his entire philosophy of Gothic upon. So this is the map, the first pictorial map from 1486 of Jerusalem, uh, showing the Dome of the Rock with an onion dome, of course, complete fantasy, because at no stage did it ever have an onion dome. And it's labeled very carefully as the Temple of Solomon. And when the Crusaders took Jerusalem, they mistook the Dome of the Rock for the Temple of Solomon. And so it became for them um, a building to be imitated and copied. And of course, the, the, the circular uh, Templar churches, like um, the Round Church in um, actually in Temple in, in London, you know, Temple, the underground station, and next to it, 
is Temple Church, which is round and directly modelled on Dome of Rock. There's another one in Cambridge, and there are several scattered across Europe. And this map became incredibly influential because, being the first pictorial map, um, it was uh, reprinted many, many times. Uh, it was part of the accounts of, of a pilgrim visiting, uh, visiting Jerusalem, and it was translated into many, many languages. And so this became how everybody envisaged um, Jerusalem, and they honestly thought that the Dome of the Rock was a Christian shrine or, or modeled on the, um, the, they thought it was the, um, the Temple of Solomon, and so copied it. Now, the trefoil arch, we see it again in an Umayyad building. Um, this, is a, this is a picture from the incredible work by Robert Hamilton on Khirbat al-Mafja, sometimes called Hisham's palace, palace, which is an Umayyad palace um, in, in what is today the West Bank, very close to Jericho. And um, Hamilton did an incredibly detailed book based on about 12 years of, of archaeological digs there in the run-up to the formation of Israel in 1948, when the whole thing stopped. But he had enough material then to, to gather and make incredible um, reconstructions of, of the pieces. So here you can see the Umayyads are already using a trefoil arch in their parapets. In, this is um, in, the, um, in the palace itself, in the main audience hall. And the other feature that Hamilton discovers in Khirbat al-Mafja is potentially the first rose window, which he um, does a, a faithful reconstruction of. Um, and today, if you visit Khirbat al-Mafja, they have um, recreated it um, here to give you a sense of that. And of course, the positioning of that, as Hamilton discovers, is high up in the pediment, and its purpose in the audience hall was to let in a decorative coloured light. Very often these, um, these early windows did have coloured glass, so you could say that this is the, the beginning of this idea of letting in uh, special glass to, to create a, a sort of special atmosphere inside. And then here is the facade of um, the Palace of Mashatra, another Umayyad palace which is um, currently um, on display in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, so you can get really up close to this one. And you can see the typical Umayyad style, the incredibly intricate, effusive carving. I mean, it was called by Oleg Grabar the, the ultimate improvisation art. And, and you can see that, that nature is just in every surface, is entangled every surface, the sheer delicate profusion of it. This is the Umayyad style, e eclectic, borrowing, building on what was before, but adding in new elements. And Anjar, the, uh, the only um, Umayyad city still, um, still on, on, on view in the Bakar Valley in, in today's Lebanon, uh, you can see the same styles, you can see the, the two-tone um, patterning of the masonry and double-decker arches, which the Umayyads were very fond of. So that's a quick run through the Umayyad things. Now we move on to Spain, because of course what happened when the um, Umayyads uh, dynasty came to an end in 750 was the Abbasids uh, slaughtered all of the Umayyad ruling family except for one Umayyad prince who managed to escape, Abu Rahman, who made his way across North Africa and founded the Umayyad dynasty in what we call Andalusia in, in, in Spain. And so here we have the Cordoba Mesquita using the same double decker idea of arches using the same two-tone um, brickwork, red and white were his dynastic colors. And you see how he has basically tried to recreate Damascus in Spain. And, and the, the, he, he takes in all the, um, the Umayyad styles and uses them on Spanish soil for the first time in the Cordoba Mesquita. Here is the, the mihrab of the Mesquita. And again, what you see immediately above it in pride of place, a row of trefoil arches. So again, they put it in the most holy places and, and the use of the horseshoe arch, which again had originated in, in Damascus. In, in the, there are various places where you can see it actually, it's very slightly in the Damascus Umayyad Mosque. And just a handful of early churches in Syria also have the, the merest hint of a horseshoe arch. 
So arches, the Omeyyads loved arches, so they had arches everywhere. So here, beyond the trefoil arch, they've got multifoil arches. So this one is what's called a sank foil. It's got five arches. And again, the double-deckered um, effect. And of course, when the, uh, when, when the Reconquista happened in Spain and the, the Mesquita was turned into church and a cathedral was plonked in the middle, um, now you have in, in, in all these arches, you have crucifixes, you have chapels all around the outside, and it's, uh, it's been totally appropriated um, by the Catholic Church. But interestingly, this is now the Cordova Synagogue, very close to the Mesquita, and you see exactly the same patterns, the sink foil, or this one is seven, uh, seven arches, if you like, the multifoil arches, and the same patterning and the same effusive designs as, as you see in, in the Umayyad style. So, so it, it carries into, into the Jewish tradition as well. This is the outside wall of the mesquita. That, um, it is covered in gateways with arches, so many different kinds of arches, tree foil arches, interlocking arches, horseshoe arches, OG arches. The, the OG arch, incidentally, um, began un, under, the, under the Fatimids in Cairo and, and found its way into Spain and, and uh, other parts of Europe, um, it's keel, called the Keel Arch, and that interestingly was again to do with light. Um, the Fatimid mosques, you know, you can see the importance of um, this light philosophy in the names of their mosques, Al-Azhar, Al-Anwar, Al-Akmar, you know, all of these names show the importance of light. So um, the styles, the, this, this wall of the, of the mesquita is just covered in arches, arches everywhere. And inside, the other critical thing inside the Cordoba mesquita is the vaulting. This is the vault, the ribbed vault, directly above the, um, the maxura, the area in front of the mihrab where the caliph would have, would have had his special place. And the ribbed vaulting here has been recently examined by architectural engineers. Just in the last few years, they got special permission to come in and do a study of it, and they were amazed by the sheer um, technical skill and use of geometry that they found. It was the most perfect example of geometry that they had ever seen. It has never needed a structural repair in, in its 1500 years. Completely remarkable. And on the back of the, uh, on the back wall of the Cordoba Mesquita, these are the masons' marks, where um, all masons worked on the building and the extensions had their special marks that they uh, were given after they had sort of reached a certain level beyond apprenticeship. And when you look at the names, they are overwhelmingly Muslim. They are uh, a few, a few are Christian, but they are overwhelmingly Muslim because the craftsmen. Still, the stone masonry, the skills from Syria, were still being used here, uh, and so it was the Muslim masons who who really had the skills, and of course passed them on um, to their Christian contemporaries. Medina to Zahra. So, in the subsequent centuries, um, this, uh, if you like, a sort of the, the most um, modern, well, the, the dying gasp of the Umayyads. Uh, another sort of hark back to the Umayyad palaces, where they wanted to be outside the urban centres. And Medina to Zahra um, in the 10th century was the most magnificent site that had ever been seen in Europe. It was so influential. This is the Salon Rico, as it's called, where ambassadors from all over Europe, bishops, and important clergymen would come to pay their respects to the caliph, and they'd never seen anything like it. Um, they took the styles um, and ideas from here, and gradually, so here, for example, this is all from Medina to Zahra, an example of the very, very ornate carving stucco in a frame, which is the first time that this starts to appear. And then as these styles and patterns start to move into um, northern Spain and then into uh, southern France, where they get used in the, uh, the route that the Benedictines are promoting for the pilgrimage to Santiago de, de Compostela, and get used in, in the early churches there, like the Puy Cathedral, for example. You take one look at it, and you can see immediately how it's borrowed so many styles from the, um, the Mayans. So, so that style of the Tree of Life that I've just shown you from Medina to Zahra 
When you get stained glass windows in panels like this, you then get things like the Tree of Jesse, which becomes a very common um, motif in stained glass windows. This is an, um, an ivory from Medina to Zahra of the seated caliph in a, a medallion, a, a lobed medallion. And that again is an innovation, Lemaire in innovation. And then you start to see it in stained glass windows where again you get motifs of and particular people or, or uh, scenes within a, um, a special lobed medallion. And then the final, the final um, sign of, of um, Moorish as it's called by this stage, um, Architecture is, of course, at the Alhambra. Now, this is too late for to have any influence on, on Gothic architecture, on medieval Gothic, but it did have a huge influence on the later Gothic revival when European travelers started to do their grand tours and come and visit um, Granada. Um, and they saw things like this. So, so this, these tile tessellations hugely influenced people like Max Escher. And people like um, Owen Jones spent six months sketching tile patterns. And he, of course, came back to this country and was then uh, one of the founder members of what became the VNA. So, so the influence of these styles um, be, you know, still, still found their way in, in, in later centuries too. So Spain was obviously the key place where um, influences came in, um, in onto, onto European soil, but there were many other gateways to Europe. So Ravenna is an absolutely key one on the coast of Italy. And I was in Ravenna just last month. And so seeing these, um, this is the um, Centre Polinare in Classe, as it's called. And uh, it, the Syrian backstory of Ravenna is astonishing. Every single bishop of Ravenna was Syrian up until the year 425. The, the patron saint of Ravenna, Apollinaris, was a native of Antioch. And the Syrian styles that um, you can recognize here are, are very strong. I mean, the, the iconography, the colors, uh, everything is, is, is immediately recognizable, very, very distinctive. And staying in Italy, of course, the trading um, empires that, that, that built up on the Italian coast, this is Amalfi, and this is, becomes incredibly important. Um, when the Amalfi traders are, are um, trading with uh, Syria, with Egypt, and they become very influenced by the, the pointed arches in the mosque of Ibn Taloun in, in Cairo. And this is all recorded, by the way, by the monasteries themselves. What happens is the Amalfi merchants pay to have these pointed arches brought back into their cathedral, uh, the Cathedral of St. Andrew in Amalfi, and then a very powerful um, abbot from Monte Cassino, Benedictine um, uh, monastery, comes to Amalfi and sees the pointed arches and thinks, oh, I like those. I would like some in Monte Cassino. So he orders the same workmen, the same uh, raw materials to come in from the east and to build them at Monte Cassino. Then the abbot of Cluny visits uh, Monte Cassino sees the arches and imports them back into Cluny, which is the most powerful monastery, Benedictine monastery in Europe at that time. And, and um, suddenly they, uh, the pointed arches become all the rage because Abbot Suja then visits Cluny and sees the arches there and realizes that this is an incredible way of letting in more light. And so not only that, they also learn that the, the pointed arch is stronger. And so you can build taller and thinner uh, walls and let in one more light. And this is the key moment that where the style, the pointed arch starts to take <laughs> in medieval times. Here we have um, St. Mark's in Venice and very obviously um, influenced by Islamic styles. I mean, Christopher Wren even says, you know, St. Mark's, he lists St. Mark's in Venice, St. Stephen's in, in um, Vienna, and Burgos Cathedral, as all having been built in the Saracen manner, as he calls them. Um, the Doge's Palace, again, very, very um, obviously Islamic influence, pointed arches, three arches, arcades of arches, um, the, the decorated merlons along the top roof crenellations, just as the Umayyads had in, in the Cordoba Mesquita and originally in Damascus. 
so all of these styles get imported and used. Um, this is the telephone dial motif, as it's, as it's known, at the Palazzo Dario in Venice. But it's di borrowed directly from a Mamluk pattern that the merchants have seen in, in uh, Cairo. And then the other um, surprising discovery um, was, was heraldry, that Saracenic heraldry, and this is thanks to the work of a German scholar who spent 10 years producing an astonishing book called Saracenic Heraldry, who um, goes right back and discovers that the fleur-de-lis was used um, as uh, on helmets with um, Saracen knights, as they were called, on the plains of Syria. So the Crusaders saw this, that, 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 that the, um, the Saracen knights were having a, a game that they called Jarid of, of horsemen with blunted javelins trying to knock each other off. And they, they, had, um, they had the fleur de they had the lion, they had various symbols on their helmets to make themselves recognizable. And this idea, the Crusaders bring back to Europe and turn it into the whole historic um, coat of arms tradition, which again becomes hugely, hugely in influential. And this is, is actually a picture of um, uh, the, the, the boy king uh, of England being crowned inside Notre Dame. Now, stained glass is another extraordinary discovery that um, it turns out that the raw materials for all of the Gothic cathedrals, the early period from the 1200s um, through till about 1400, most of the raw materials in those churches came from Syria because it was the best. It's what the workmen, the craftsmen liked to work with it because they had this um, organic plant ash called Ushnan, the flux which makes the glass very easy to work with, very malleable. And it gives this, this incredible opaque quality with the bubbles and the imperfections in it, which give them, when the sun shines through, a very sort of sacred and spiritual type of light. And recent, recent studies have been done, uh, and glass analyses on the stained glass to show that Canterbury Cathedral, Bork Cathedral, Saint Denis, all of these places have what they call the Islamic composition in their stained glass. And not only that, but um, Syria under the Abbasids was the, the world leader in, uh, in glass. I mean, they were quite simply the most skilled. And in Damascus, uh, they developed the technique of being able to use enameled paint on glass. Uh, and of course, all that came to an end in 1401 with the invasion of Tamerlane, when all the craftsmen were taken away back to Samarkand. Um, continues in, um, in Egypt for a while, that technique, the Venetians discover this technique where, whereby a stained glass window, therefore, could be used like a, a sheet of glass, like a, like a canvas, and so the artist would paint directly onto the glass and then fire the glass and make it permanent and, and then just cut it up into these regular glazing bars. You can recognize it immediately by the, the, the rectangular shape where all they've done is, is just regularly cut it like that. And this style was invented in Syria. So, and, and then the Venetians kept secret, uh, very, very typical canny, canny businessmen. They kept it secret on the island of Murano for as long as they possibly could and made sure that nobody else for a long time. Military borrowings. Um, this is Chateau Gaia on, uh, overlooking the Seine in, in Rouen. Again, I was there just last month. And this is the castle that Richard Lionheart built on return from the Crusades, where he used a lot of the military innovations that he had seen used by, um, by the Saracens, as he would have called them. And uh, the styles are still there to see now. Um, and Richard the Lionheart was, this was his favorite castle. He called it My Fair Castle. And, um, I, think, I believe he, he, he also founded the town at the, at the foot of it, Les Andelis. And he, uh, the styles, you can even see them in the town, town below. You can recognize so many things which um, he would have brought back in from having seen them um, on, on the Crusades. Now, this next chapter, we're moving now to Ottomans and Domes. So obviously, Hagia Sophia is the, the prime dome. In fact, um, although obviously the later mosque did copy Hagia Sophia as the dome, we have to remember that the dome itself, Hagia Sophia, kept on collapsing 
um, kept falling down, had to be repaired many times. It's actually got a total of 24 buttresses around it. And uh, Sinan Kinzal, um, the great uh, Turkish um, uh, Ottoman architect, was obviously the dome maker par excellence, who uses then the Islamic dome technique of the double domes and does eventually outdo Hagia Sophia. And Sinan, um, I, I do actually um, in this chapter a kind of parallel between Christopher Wren and Sinan because they make quite an interesting pairing. Um, they were about a hundred years or so apart in, in timing. Sinan was, was that bit earlier, but both men had to work well, Sinan had to work with three separate sultans. Christopher Wren had to work under six different monarchs. And all of them managed, they lived to 90, the fine old age of 90, and built the most extraordinary monuments and had a huge awareness of how important it was for the political statement of architecture. They had to dominate the skyline. And this is what Christopher Wren does also with, um, with St. Paul's Cathedral, of course. Now, Moving on to the, the revival period, so of course in the Gothic revival now we have buildings like the Houses of Parliament covered in arches, uh, this is a detail of the Houses of Parliament, we've got OG arches, trefoil arches, pointed arches, uh, blind arches, you, you know, interlocking arches, it's just covered in arches, everything taken um, from Islamic styles. This is Montmartre in Paris, which according to its own website is heavily influenced by Islamic architecture. At the gates of the double domes. And this is, of course, where Dennis, our famous Dennis, um, carrying his head, finally apparently fell and died. And so that's why it's called Montmartre, but the place of the, the mount, you know, the hill of the martyr um, overlooking Paris. And finally, here, um, I give 10 out of 10 to anyone who can guess uh, where this is. Uh, because again, you look at this effusive carving on the facade of this. This is Gothic Revival Cathedral and of course it, it, you can see the styles you know you can just recognize this effusiveness of Gothic and the, the you know related back to the effusiveness of the Vermeer architecture as well because uh, Anthony Gaudi who built this extraordinary Sagrada Familia in Barcelona he was openly influenced by his architecture he talks about not <laughs> residing in the spatial uncertainties of a building he said nature has no right angles everything um, must be organic and self-supporting. And so this photo that I'm ending on now just shows you how he achieves that without buttresses, no, not a single flying buttress at the Sagrada Familia. And he manages that, but of course it's taken him a very long time. He worked on it for 43 years until he died and it won't be completed until 2026. And that is meant to be the, the 100th anniversary after his after his death and people even when he was alive berated him for the slowness of his work to which he replied uh, being a very religious man he said my my client is not in a hurry and so that's all i'm going to do now that's a very quick run through um i should say that the book itself um has been beautifully produced by her so they've put in 150 pictures throughout um, um in where relevant throughout the text and have done a beautiful job. And it did sell out on day one. I'm still slightly in shock from that. The big print is on the way. And I'm told it will be arriving um, from Glasgow on the 11th of September. But there are still a few copies that Hearst holds that can be obtained using that Saracen's 25 code to get the discount. Um, or Amazon has still got a few in stock as well. So that's where I would direct you if you would like to get hold of a copy. Thanks very much. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, I'm very relieved that we managed to maintain the link and excuse the strange noises, but for some reason, if we coughed, it, it freed the line again. Oh, really? so that was, that was, yes, it, I don't know whether it adjusts the level or adjust the connection so i apologize for that but it, we, we were keeping you online and with the link um Excellent. well done well done <laughs> <laughs> the technical challenges we were both um both um banging on the table and clinking the glass but thank you very much that was very very interesting and, and absolutely wonderful uh, pictures now i just wonder if anybody would like to ask any questions uh, if so, you can use your 
the, the chat icon at the bottom of your screen to, to, to send, send a question. We've got one from Deborah. We've got, yes, um, would you like to? Yeah. All right, um, the message, um, this is from uh, Deborah. Uh, congratulations, Diana, thank you for an excellent overview. Um, she asks a question which is not actually related to your talk, but uh, how is your own house in Damascus these days? <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm pleased to report that it's absolutely fine. Um, and it's, it's had uh, a Syrian friend of mine and his family living there now for the last four years. He himself a restoration architect, rather, actually. Um, uh, and so the house itself is fine. Thank you very much. Yes, I mean, it, uh, as you may know, it was... Stolen. You know, I had five refugee families living in it for the early part of the war, and then it was stolen in the middle of the war in 2014. And uh, uh, I had to, um, you know, all my friends were put in prison, arrested, all the rest of it, was ghastly, <laughs> ghastly business. But um, I managed to get it back, and so Alhamdulillah, it is fine for the moment and has been fine. And I hope that um, because uh, my friend lived there, he works for the Al Khan Foundation, they have a kind of diplomatic immunity, so he is not being um, hassled by the authorities, basically, so that is good. Thanks, thank you for your concern for it. And I will never sell it, incidentally, the other, that's the other thing people always ask me, will you ever sell that house? And the answer is, is in that I never bought it to make money or sell it. <laughs> We just have another uh, comment um, from Gwen Bennett. How does or does the Syrian style manifest itself when there isn't stone or brick for building material? Sorry, uh, you, your voice um, oh, went a bit strange. Up then, yes. Okay, yeah. I'll try again. Uh, how does or does the Syrian style manifest itself when there isn't stone or brick for building material? So it, it, is it in other... Other, is it found in other materials, I suppose, if you're talking, you know... Right, well, I mean, it, it can be found in, in, the, in the stucco work, uh, definitely the carving of the stucco work. Um, and, uh, yes, I mean, the, 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 the patterning, I mean, it's true that, of course, the spring stone masons were, um, you know, were, were, were the best, quite clearly, you know, they had, they had, I mean, for, from, from the beginnings of, of, of uh, the earliest history, I mean, stone is a material that is everywhere in Syria. So stone, stone masons, you know, it was the obvious thing to develop. Whereas, of course, in, in Iraq, under the Abbasids, when they moved to Baghdad, it was brick. They didn't have stone. They only had mud. So they became, you know, workers in brick. Um, so uh, but the stucco carving is is um, is is very um, is very clear in in many buildings. The more you look, the more you find. Actually, I mean, this this recent road trip that I've just done all around Europe, down to Venice and Ravenna, and all across France, looking at Gothic cathedrals, it's it's just so striking how much there is. The more the more you dig, the more you find. It, it it's it really deepens your appreciation of of the European architecture because um, you know it enriches your 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 understanding of it and you, you when you see the backstory. Um, <coughs> this I certainly found it it, it um, uh, it's just you know you you start to see everything with with new eyes. Yeah. We've just got one other comment here. This is from someone who studied at uh, the AUC and said we were taught that most Mamluk architecture was Crusader influenced and you've turned this upside down and she's just asking or he's just asking what have been the challenges to your theories and conclusions what challenges well, have you faced oh well i'm sure they're all yet to come i mean i'm quite sure of that um i mean i'm 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 the point of my book is, is to show how first came. i'm not really <laughs> but the mamluks don't really come into it very much actually I, mean, I just showed that one example in Venice, um, but the Mamluks didn't really. I mean, because I'm mainly focusing on Gothic because of the Saracen Wren, the, the <coughs> Saracen quote, um, where, where Wren says, "What we call Gothic should be called Saracenic." This is the main thing I'm looking at through the book. So, so the Mamluks are too late for that, really. So, so they, they only come in, um, you know, sometimes in passing, really. 
Uh, so, so I make no apology for not for not dealing with with the Mamluks that much. Are there any more questions? Well, I think we can we can finish there. And um, I'd just like to say thank you very much to everybody for for joining us this evening, and thank you very much, Diana. Oh, we have one one more uh, question actually from Michael Starks. Could you explain more fully the Syrian influence on San Apollinare in Classe in Viet in Ravenna? Yes, okay, well, the, it, um, it, it's the mosaics themselves, the coloring, the green, the gold, and the, the iconography, the styles, the, the use of the sheep as the block. All of these um, styles, obviously early, early Christian, and you can still, so when I talked about the dead cities, I mean, now the mosaics uh, are lost. In, in there, but in the Tur Abdin in southeast Turkey, there are still a handful of monasteries like Mar Gabriel, for, for, for example, where you can still see um, fragments of the mosaics there in the early Syriac style, and you, you can recognize it immediately. I mean, the, the colors, uh, the, the green, the gold, the, 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 the use of the, the Lamb of God, um, uh, the, the use of the cross, the, the stars in the blue uh, firmament. Uh, it, there are many things that you can identify. And the Tur Abdin in, in southeast Turkey is the place where, where you can still see tiny fragments of it. But originally, of course, there would have been much more of it that has been lost. And the, the main influence on the church of Santa Polinara in Classe, which incidentally was Classe, the port of Ravenna, was full of Syrians, Syrian bankers, Syrian merchants, Syrian priests. I mean, uh, astonishing how, how, how Syrian influenced it was. Um, and the building that is meant to have influenced uh, the, the very first one on, on which um, places like San Vitale in Ravenna and, and San Vitale was a church in Antioch, which is sadly now lost. Um, I explain all this in the book. Uh, it was it was unfortunately destroyed in, in earthquakes. It was rebuilt once or twice, but then it was completely lost. And in that its site is known. It's only from um, from contemporary records that we know of its existence and, and a, um, a couple of early drawings. It's often, um, it's interesting how often the source of uh, knowledge for for these um, for what we what we understand now is actually the, the Christian um, records themselves, because a lot of the monasteries, the bishops, they all wrote histories. So I'm actually reading at the moment um, the, the, the famous history um, of um, the, 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 the Ravenna bishops. Um, and it's, it's an amazing record because, because the bishops wanted to record what they were building, what they were using, yeah. where the workmen came from. And time and again, um, they are asking for workmen in Ravenna to be sent from um, from from the east, from Byzantium, not necessarily from Constantinople itself, but from Antioch, the other great mosaic center. So um, all these influences are coming into Europe um, that way. Um, I have another uh, question from Barbara Brend as to when when are squinches? When do they come into use and, and pendentives? Right, well, squinch is the first known squinch is actually in Iran, in, in Firuzabad, um, so um, in, in the palace of so, again, Iran is very, very important in this, you know, and a lot of early, um, I, I think, uh, I, and again, I explain this in the book, but a lot of the influences on the Umayyads um, were, were clearly from Iran as well. <laughs> Some of the sort of mythical beasts that they use in their stucco carving, um, is uh, you know you can you, you can see that um, uh, the same the same sort of griffin like figures um, which are said to have uh, originated in Iran. So uh, there's everything going on. So you can you can the influences have certainly um, uh, you know can be tracked uh, quite quite carefully, and a lot of people have devoted their lives to studying one particular aspect. So, for example, Venice and um, Deborah Howard, the um, professor of architectural history at Cambridge, um, you know, devoted 10 years to a wonderful book of Venice and the East. So, 
I relied heavily on that for my section on Venice. And it's, um, it's uh, you know, very, very clear that, um, you know, so she has done the work for me. I can come along and join the dots of all the work that these early scholars have done um, and, and create a big picture that is accessible to the general public. That's what I'm trying to do, is actually to, to, to make it accessible um, to, to a much broader audience. Right. Well, I think... I think I'm, I'm terrified that this thing will, will scrunch up. So I think we will, we will finish there. Um, I, we, you've got a lot of uh, good wishes from many people saying thank you very much and how much they enjoyed it. Uh, Rabindra from Ahmed, Ahmadabad in India, because he won't look at architecture in the same way again. So there are lots of people who are really, ever really enjoyed your talk. So thank you very much indeed. So I think we will finish there for today. I'm very sorry about this connection. Um, this sometimes happens, I'm afraid, on Zoom. And I'm just glad that we were able to clink our way through it and we were able to hear you very clearly all the way through. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, and, and thank you very much for hosting me and, and congratulations on managing, managing the technology. I'm, I'm, I'm full yeah. of awe and very impressed. <laughs> Not as well as I would have liked to. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.